Welcome to another episode of our podcast, Calvary Life. I'm Paul Thompson. And I'm Charles Uptain. We're a little bit fatigued today. We just got back in last night from the annual meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention in New Orleans. And so we wanted to give a little bit of an update on some things we talked about before the convention, maybe some things we learned, saw, experienced while we were there, and some things that might be helpful for our congregation here. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure a minivan with six people in it was the best travel arrangements, but I guess we made it through. <laughs> it builds camaraderie, I suppose, <laughs> along the way. So we appreciate Tommy Perry driving for us the whole time, getting us there there and back, even even after hitting a 18-wheeler uh, tire in the middle of it. So, but we Yeah, that, it. that cost us a little time and poor Tommy some damage to his, to his van, but uh, we also appreciate Calvary folks for supporting us and enabling us to go, sending us, and uh, along with the six of us who went, um, Tommy Perry, um, Charles, Dan Tankersley, Patrick Lima, um, my wife Cecilia, and then also uh, Randy and Sandra Hunt, and Larry and Kathy Latta all went as messengers from Calvary. Yep. So you can have up to 12, and so we took 10. That's a pretty good, pretty good crew. Yeah, I wish, I wish more and more churches would take advantage of their full allotment, make themselves aware, because you really can only make those changes when you're there at the meeting. And as we saw at this meeting, like other meetings, some changes can happen rather rapidly. And if you're not there, physically present, if you're not in the room when the vote takes place, then you're going to miss it. And you can spend all year talking about it, but if you're not present, you can't do anything about it. And one of the big issues this year was the issue of disfellowshipping some churches because of their policy or practice of ordaining women as pastors. And, you know, Charles, we were in there in the room and a few churches appealed their dismissal or, or being removed, being disfellowshipped. And so they had an opportunity to make their case. And then there was a rebuttal from a representative of the credentials committee and the executive committee, but really all of it took place rather quickly. Yeah. And three minutes to present your case with 10 seconds of overflow. If you went over time, then same for rebuttal and then a vote from the floor and that was it. So issues that have been discussed and tweeted about, blogged about, um, and will be talked about for a long time to come, really all decided within a span of about 15 minutes. So yeah. that's how important the actual business of the convention is. Yeah, and those those votes were done, a lot of times it was just raise your ballot, but those votes were done by written ballots and they took them all up. So we didn't find out the results of that until the second day, but really the results were pretty clear. I mean, they were overwhelming. Yeah, you could just see the, the mood of the room and um, even when Rick Warren was making his case in defense of Saddleback being reinstated, um, some of his statements that he made, he made a point that that Saddleback Church agrees with the Baptist faith and message 99.9999% with the exception of one word, and that word is about women as pastors. And when he said, is that not close enough? People were shouting him down from the no. room. No, no. <laughs> exactly. so, yeah, I don't think he was surprised by the outcome. I think he was resigned to it. I also felt like that maybe he didn't set himself up well in the days leading up to the convention. The mask mail out campaigns, the just the I mean the Twitter rants. I, I really think I really think he created resistance when he got there. I think the average person in the pew, the average messenger, probably does not like the idea of being pressured into or swayed into. And I don't think he made a good case. And then when he actually made his defense on the floor, it sounded like someone else making his case for him, just reading some of his tweets and just sort of recapping what we'd already heard. And it wasn't a great, it wasn't a strong case. And then Al Mohler, Dr. Al Mohler, president of uh, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, gave the response or the reply and gave a very th thoroughly theological biblical case for the exclusivity of women in the role of elder. And uh, I think it was kind of a slam dunk at that point. Yeah, I was, you know, I was, I guess, pleased also with just the, the messengers that were there. It seemed, um, you know, I don't know, I haven't been to one before at all, but just seeing things and um, reading things about the messengers, what happened in Anaheim, I really was wondering, was it going to be more of a 50-50 kind of split? And maybe we were more headed towards an egalitarian kind of um, stance, but it really didn't seem that way at all. It seemed like um, we are still staunchly pastors should be men, and that's very, I'm very thankful for that. 
Yeah, I think the the overwhelming response, 90 plus percent in response to it was was strong. The the trickle down from this is going to be interesting to, to watch and monitor going forward, though, because so many churches are just, I'll say either, I don't know, uninformed or maybe unintentionally sloppy with their staff titles, the nomenclature, just throwing the word around minister, etc. And what we would say here, what we've always taught and, and practiced is if someone does not meet the biblical qualifications of elder, one of those being male, but also the responsibilities attributed to that role, the ability to speak to the whole congregation, to preach a sermon, for instance, to perform marriages, do funerals, but to have that overall overseeing responsibility of an elder for an entire congregation, not for one ministry area. Those people would be called directors, so they direct a team of volunteers under the leadership of another pastor elder, that sort of thing. We've always been very clear about that, and so we've intentionally not given those positions titles of minister, right? because I think it's confusing to people. I'm, I'm not sure how the average person attending church would differentiate between pastor, minister. Yeah. And I think we just need to be precise with our titles. And so for us, when we say pastor, we are meaning someone that we recognize having the qualifications of a biblical elder and also they've accepted that responsibility here. We've selected them here. We recognize and have chosen them for that role here. They've received it and they exercise that capacity here. They work in that capacity here. So I think some churches are going to have to figure out moving forward what, what do they do with some of those titles. And I think it's a good and healthy exercise, so they're not confused, and they're not confusing their people about those titles. So anyway, so the response to that was was really good, I think. And then, as a follow-up to that, an amendment was proposed to the very constitution of the Southern Baptist Convention. So of course, the Baptist faith and message already speaks of only two offices, right? pastor, elder, and deacon. And there was good reference, which I thought was so healthy, Good discussions referencing back to the first Baptist Faith and Message, the original in 1925, which, and it was said in several different occasions, um, that that was a derivative from or an offspring of the New Hampshire Confession of Faith, which we use here at Calvary, which informed the original Baptist Faith and Message, a restating of that New Hampshire Confession, and identified those two offices. So I thought that was really strong. But then the Mike Law Amendment which was then adjusted a little bit by uh, Pastor Juan Sanchez, came to the floor to address the very Constitution. And the exact reading of that, do you have the, the exact wording of that amendment? No, I, I don't have it in front of me. I'll have to pull that up. But basically the, the, the point of it is to, um, to add another phrase, another statement underneath the Constitution that talks about churches that are, that are in friendly cooperation. And and it and uh, Juan Sanchez made it more of a positive churches that affirm um, men only and in the role of pastor and elder um, was the was the point of it. I don't have the exact text there, but um, you know I, I think that was the the point Mike Law was trying to make and has tried to make all year. Um, and really, there was a lot of doubt if that was going to happen or not. Yeah, this was, this was his movement, I mean, sorry, his amendment, uh, his motion from the floor. I move that the Constitution of the Southern Baptist Convention be amended to include an enumerated sixth item. The enumerated sixth item under Article 3, Paragraph 1 concerning composition would read, does not affirm, of course this is speaking to any local church, does not affirm, appoint, or employ a woman as a pastor of any kind. And then, of course, as you said, there was um, some editing of that just a little bit. And... Uh, and there was some contention on this one. There was some, there was some resistance to this one, but it did pass. Yep. Now, whether or not it will be sustained and that constitutional change will be sustained remains to be seen. Yeah, I didn't realize that it was a two-year process that has got to be voted on two years in a row to, to actually change the Constitution. So we'll see what happens next year. So now messengers have to rally again and attend next year in Indianapolis and vote to ratify it again. Meanwhile, on the last day of the annual meeting, a new task force was put together. Some former seminary presidents uh, sort of flexed their influence, it seems, and stepped up to the podium, or stepped up to the, one of the floor mics, and proposed a task force, which was put into play, which will evaluate and report back to the convention on what do we mean by what was the term? How are we using the term? Friendly cooperation. Friendly cooperation. What is friendly cooperation? 
um, Charles, I'm hoping on this one that their, their motivations are sincere. I'm hoping that this is not a backdoor way of undoing what was just done with the uh, Mike Law Amendment. Right. Um, because that's the real question. The question was, the, re, the, re, the expectation is that churches would, would closely identify with the Baptist faith and message, and now we're parsing out every word. Several years ago, Dr. Moeller had said at a previous convention that if we do this on every word in our confession, every word in our Baptist faith and message, if we have to parse every word, we're doomed. Yeah. If we can't just read it for its plain meaning. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, what takes place next year. Yeah, but they've got their work cut out of, on them to, to be able to, uh, whatever they come up with, even if they don't have the best intentions, if they are trying to water down the Mike Law Amendment, because that amendment is to the Constitution, it's not to the Baptist faith and message. And so, you know, the friend of cooperation, as I understand, is more towards the Baptist faith than message. The Constitution is what the Constitution is. Yeah. You know, so it's, they'd have their, they're going to have their work cut out with, for them if they really can figure out a way to water that down. Let's, let's just hope that it stands. Yeah. And I know this. I know this is not a popular um, change. I know the Mike Law Amendment is not going to be popular with culture. It's not going to be popular with other religious groups. I've seen pushback already on, on social media today. I do believe it's the right statement, and I believe it was a necessary statement for clarity. One of the arguments um, that we heard that came up at the annual meeting was that this was an unnecessary amendment, that it's already addressed in the Baptist Faith and Message. Why do we have to amend the Constitution to clarify? But we've done this before. Yep. We've amended the Constitution before on the subject of racism, which was already addressed, on the subject of um, was it sexual abuse? Mm -hmm. We've amended the Constitution on areas that we think are critical for clarification. I think this is no less critical than that yep. for the healthy ecclesiology of our church and cooperation built around truth. One of the things we heard a lot on this um, at this meeting was, again, it was promulgated by, by Rick Warren mostly, but it was echoed by some others who spoke that our unity should be around our, our mission and I think that's a little bit of a false dichotomy. I think we can be unified around a gospel-centered Great Commission mission and still be unified around the truth. And let's not forget that the Great Commission requires us not only to go into all the world and make disciples, but it commands us to teach them everything that Jesus commanded. So I'm not sure that shortcutting discipleship or doctrinal clarity is a good way to accomplish the Great Commission long term. Yeah. Um, what did you think about Bar Barber being reelected and how he did in leading the meeting. I, I was really pleasantly surprised at the way that Bart Barber led the meeting. Um, he was not heavy handed. I really felt like he was fair and gracious in the way he handled it. And maybe this is just a personal perspective. I guess it is. I, I've been to some of these meetings sometimes where the presiding president, the leader from the platform can really be condescending mm -hmm. and belittling even to messengers from the floor. Just because you're an expert on parliamentary procedure and Robert's Rules of Order doesn't mean that that messenger from whatever church, whatever normal church, and whatever city or state in our convention has to be. And I thought Barbara was very gracious in actually helping people form their motions better, make their statements more clearly, and even when they did have to be corrected or informed that what they were stating was out of order or not properly placed, very gracious, and I, and I thought he handled it well and was just some good humor. I would say overall, it was the best led meeting that I've been to. Yeah. Um, so I thought he did well at that. Um, I did not vote for Bart Barber. I voted, I cast my vote for Mike Stone because I believe there's some critical issues that still need to be addressed that are not being addressed. I fear that um, too many with whom I disagree have too much influence over decisions that are still being made. And so that was the primary motivation in casting my vote for Mike. But at the same time, I, I certainly can understand the sentiment that I heard from others who feel very much like I do on, on most issues that uh, Bart has led well and handled difficult situations well and has not done anything to disqualify himself from a second term. So I didn't feel like it was a die on this hill issue that he should not be reelected. Um, I just had a preference, and so I had to cast a vote. And I was one of about a third. It was a pretty overwhelming majority that voted for, for Bart Barber. 
and I was about a third who didn't. But I hope that we'll see better than we heard from some of the comments from the platform. I hope we hear a greater understanding of the concerns of the one third. Yeah. And a little more respect for. I was really dismayed by the convention sermon that followed these uh, major votes that was given by Todd Unzinger from uh, North Carolina, the Baptist State Convention there, that was really disparaging, I thought, of any opposition. Um, it, was a, it was an odd sermon in my mind, used really to malign and attack any opposition, shut down any questions, even question the motives of those people who oppose certain things or question certain things. So I thought uh, I would just encourage anyone else to see for themselves, judge for yourself, listen to the sermon, and see for yourself. I, I didn't even consider it a sermon. I use that term lightly. Um, there was a little scripture in it, no exposition of scripture really, and I really thought the the object was more to to berate and to celebrate even the victory. So it was just it was just an odd and unfortunate message. I don't think it did anything for our unity at all. I think it was more disrupting and discouraging than helpful. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I, I thought it was misplaced and, and um, really not needed. I mean, I think, uh, I'm not sure how much we need a, a sermon on t day two when there's so much business that needs to be done anyway, but, um, but it just seemed to be uh, not in, in line with everything else that was trying to be done there to me. Well, you know, that's another issue, and I talked about that with some other pastors too that I know and guys I met at the door, even some local pastors here. At the risk of sounding unspiritual, there is a pastor's conference the day before right. the convention that's centered on preaching and quality sermons and, and, and good teaching. And I'm all for certain slots allotted to worship time. I think maybe to a lot of time, a lot a certain period of time, say from eight in the morning till nine, this is gonna be our worship hour and we're gonna sing together and we're gonna pray and you're gonna hear a, an encouraging biblical sermon. I think that would be great. I think the challenge is we have such a limited amount of time to conduct real important business and interspersed in between those times where you've got three minutes to discuss and the clock is running up there, visibly running on the screen, but then later on we'll have someone just giving a meandering speech or long conversation or a few songs interjected. Um, I thought this is not how we would do it in our local church. We would right. have our time of worship and then we would devote ourselves to business. And one thing I just felt again and again that's a little bit broken in the system is there's never enough time to discuss the things that need to be discussed. Yeah, and I, and I understand some of that because, you know, as leading the business meetings here, our members meetings, which are very tame, I appreciate how our church is, is so unified in most things that we do that it doesn't cause any issues. But, you know, you don't want to get that, that wild question that throws you off or, or really doesn't have anything to do with it. And that wastes time. So there's a balance and I don't, know, I don't know how you do that better to have people ask questions earlier or somebody vet the questions. I don't even know if that would work because it'd be who was vetting, but, but just some way to keep the wildness out, but then also allow people to really who have a, a real question to ask real questions, you know? Well, that's a little bit of the confusion, I think, from perspective of church members back home. You send your messengers, sometimes they're your pastors and staff, sometimes they're uh, church members, but you send them and you send them to get answers for you. And in your mind, I think you have this picture that they're going to go and they're going to be able to stand up and ask questions. But truthfully, when you see the way the meeting takes place, only two or three, maybe five, are going to be recognized at any point. So when the ERLC, for instance, gets up and gives their report, sure, I have questions I'd like to ask, but so do hundreds of others. And there's only a scant amount of time given to answer any of those questions, and they tend to go in predictable directions. Right, And so it's very difficult in the context of this two-day meeting to get answers to all the questions that you'd like. Now, I'll tell you one question that was raised um, by several people and was raised at one of the microphones is a question we've had and we did not get a good answer to, and yeah. that's financial accountability. Right. Yeah. And I, and I really, even, even to a vote in that, and really didn't understand the vote of the messengers to not ask for it as well. Yeah, someone made a motion and it was seconded from the floor to require each convention entity. So these entities would be, for instance, the International Mission Board, the North American Mission Board, the Ethics and Religious Liberties Commission, et cetera, for each of these entities to report back to the convention with the same sort of data, full financial disclosure, that would be required by the government. What's the form? 990. A 990 form. Not requiring them to 
provide a 990 form because they're not required that for the government's sake, but to give that level of content back to the messengers right. so we could know where the funds are. And I thought, wow, this is promising. Um, again, somebody strongly made the motion. It was seconded. It went to the floor for a vote, and we just had a raised hand ballot vote, and it didn't pass. That was that was confounding to me, and I tweeted that, that that was a confounding moment to me. And I still, that's what I'm going to have to explore more with some convention leaders and things. Why do you suppose that the majority of people did not want that level of transparency? Right. Yeah. And, and the problem was all, all of us voted the same way, so we couldn't ask anybody, you know? Yeah. <laughs> if, we, if, we had, if we had seen some people that we knew that maybe voted the other way, it would have been nice to have conversations to figure that out. But just never had an answer of why it was voted down like it was. Well, I stirred just a minor bit of controversy. I, I tweeted something after Kevin Ezell's presentation with the North American Mission Board, where he gave a statement about the level of support given to North American Mission Board church planters. Right. Sin City church planters, the amount of money that was um, given to them each month in support, health insurance, things like that. And I just simply tweeted, I can assure you that our North American Mission Board endorsed church planter in Manhattan does not receive the level of support that Kevin Ezell just stated NAM church planners received. I got a follow-up response to that from the Sin City Coordinator from North American Mission Board for New York. And so we've got a follow-up meeting coming up soon, but I just wanted to discuss those things. I was not trying to be difficult. I was not trying to be controversial. I just simply wanted to say that's not happening and we'd like to know where the support is going. And for a church like ours, it gives a substantial amount every year, not only to the cooperative program, but also to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering and has a NAM supported endorsed church planter who receives a minimal amount of support from the North American Mission Board. Uh, I would just like to, I'd like to look at the numbers. Right. And I'd like to know what should he be receiving? Is this the max he can receive? Are these all the benefits he's eligible for? And I would also like to know what is the criteria that's being applied to say a church planter in Manhattan versus one in Las Vegas, for instance, where we're reading about homes being purchased for church planters or considerable stipends being given, uh, salary stipends, et cetera. So I just want to know. I just, I just want the information. And so I'm going to still keep trying to get that outside right. of the annual meeting. Right. And so one, one person actually asked that question and, uh, to Kevin Ezell and, and his answer, you know, I think it was, a, it was something he had thought about before. He knew he was going to get that question, you know, and he gave his tweetable answer about uh, get buying his Christmas decorations at Hobby Lobby, you know, that was his answer, um, which I guess was some, a little bit of pushback towards Southwestern, you know, in the situation they've gone through. But still, it just wasn't an answer to, you know, basically his answer is we have trustees and that's yeah. what the trustees do. Yeah, that's the, that seemed to be the overarching response in general to every entity. And I guess theoretically, that is how we've always operated. But the message that was given to us to, and to every messenger was just trust us, trust the system, trust the trustees. But, and I'm not saying this is an indictment of every other entity, but I am saying the example that we saw, the abuses, financial abuses I'm speaking of, at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary under Adam Greenway's leadership have caused all of us to really question the efficacy of, of the trustee system. Right. How could it be that way? Yeah. How, could, how could that sort of rogue spending take place right under your noses and you not be aware of it? Are there no checks and balances? So what are the trustees actually doing? And my own questions would be, is the trustee system broken? Do we have too many trustees for each um, entity? And what real authority do they have? I, and I just don't know the answers to the question. So again, in light of what we just found out about Southwestern Seminary and how they're trying to recover and recoup, rebuild, it just, uh, I was just surprised that there weren't more people thinking the same thing. Let's have yeah. some accountability. Yeah. Well, we'll see where it goes in the future. I was I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, I, I didn't think I didn't think we had a. I thought it could be a very tumultuous um, annual meeting and could really have some lasting effects. But the lasting effects I saw seemed to be good to me. I think we could be headed in the right direction in some ways, especially doctrinally, which is very promising. I think there's greater clarity on um, who we are, who identifies with us. I hope that one of the ripple effects from what took place and the votes that took place will just be some integrity on behalf of those churches that are part of the Southern Baptist Convention that don't align with us. And they right. know they do not. For instance, I saw the response today in a letter by their pastor, and it's on social media, First Baptist Church, I believe it is, Gainesville, 
Georgia. Well, this is a church that has not identified closely with the Southern Baptist Convention for decades now. They are predominantly active in the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, which is the liberal moderate, if you will, I say liberal alternative and, uh, to the convention. And they've given but minimal um, attention to or had minimal involvement in the Southern Baptist Convention and by their own admission, primarily only for benefits, which I'm assuming is Guidestone retirement benefits. So just in order to maintain their Guidestone benefits for their staff, they've maintained an affiliation. So now they're pronouncing that they're leaving. Well, they left long ago. I, I, think, I think pastors, churches, church leadership, need to be honest and show some integrity. If you don't agree with the Baptist faith and message, that should not be our burden to seek you out. We should not be trying to find all those with whom we can disagree. That's not our point. That, that is a distraction from mission. Right. Um, I think that's up to every church. I, do you, with integrity, agree to this statement of faith? I think another myth that got exposed a little bit, and we, we saw it, and when I say we saw it, I, here's what I'm referencing. For you guys who are listening, you know, for everyone who's listening, what I mean, the sort of things that people tweet or post or, or blog about, some of them are just outright deceptions that Baptists have never been a creedal people or a confessional people. That's absolutely false, and it's easily demonstrated to be false just by looking at history. Right. Baptists have been a confessional and creedal people. We've become less so over the years, but it doesn't mean that we were not originally thoroughly creedal and confessional. We had to say in this vast cornucopia of of evangelicalism in the in the early Americas, what's distinct about us from mm -hmm. Lutherans, um, Episcopal, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Methodists, etc. And we had confessions of faith that said that. In fact, we were rigorously confessional. Almost every area had their own confession. Churches were drawing up their own confessions. Look at some of the confessions, even our own state. Um, the uh, Tuscaloosa had, had their own confession, a Baptist confession, these rigorous confessions that say, this is who we are. And so when we say we're not, that we've never been a confessional, that's just not true. Yeah. Now, we, we devolve from it, but I think we're returning to it, and necessarily so. And the times demand that. I oh, think yeah. that's the issue. The times demand it. Yeah, where, do we, where do we stand? The culture, we need to be able to say what we believe. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful. I mean, walking in the door this morning, someone said, so how was the... So how was the meeting? I said, well, you know, it was mixed. They're, they're always mixed a little bit. Some things I would like to have seen different. Um, I'd like to have heard, I was very disappointed with the presentation from Lifeway, for instance. Um, someone rightly challenged Lifeway on some of the authors and books that are still, and, um, still being promoted, sold by Lifeway. And instead of addressing the issues of heresy, bad teaching doctrine the response basically was trust our people they work hard mm -hmm. someone asked why we're still promoting beth moore which even when beth moore did identify as a southern baptist um, her work was more than questionable we should have been removing her material for her 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 teachings not just her tweetings way back then but now that she very publicly has divorced herself from southern baptist um, very clearly established herself in positions antagonistic towards us. Why are we still promoting her? And the response was, have you read her memoir? Have you read her book? And it was a promotion. I thought that was really strange. And it was a contentious responses from Ben Mandrell. And um, so that was, that was troublesome. And I think there are also some, some concerns with where our Ethics and Religious Liberties Commission is leading us. I think maybe this terminology won't uh, be familiar with everyone, but there is a growing percentage of, of pastors, leaders, church members, churches in the in the convention that are pushing for a more abolitionist approach to abortion, that abortion should be criminalized across the board, not only for the practitioners, not just for the physicians, but for those for those women who choose this, who celebrate this. Um, we saw some posts um, yesterday, today, uh, a cake celebrating you know, got you this cake for your abortion. And mm -hmm. we've seen some of these parades and some of these signs and some of these things of people celebrating this. Um, we still seem to be a little bit ambiguous on our approach towards towards abortion, I'm afraid. And, and I think that's troublesome. I think there are some other questions about does the ERLC represent the, the mainstream of the Southern Baptist Convention, yeah. people in the pews. What are they, how are they representing us when it comes to immigration, 
or gun control or you know so many other issues. I think there's some real question marks that are going to have to be be addressed in, in days to come. I do want to end on a positive note. However, it was it was really good to see the report from the International Mission Board. We saw 79 new missionaries commissioned, some of those in into dangerous places. Um, some of those were introduced to us literally behind a screen. We just saw their silhouettes, heard their voices because they're going to places where they can't be identified. Yeah. I applaud them. I applaud the work of the International Mission Board and a new strategic effort to begin to explore the most unreached places on earth um, was very, very encouraging to see. I thought that was a real positive. And one other positive to me was we attended two nights of the nine marks at nine churches that have similar mindsets to ours um, gathering and just the robust robust singing there together and and i don't know how what would you say a couple thousand people in there yeah I, I, it, the it was a full ballroom i mean it was full i mean i don't want to be wrong about the number or overestimate 1500 2000 people perhaps starting the meetings at nine o'clock going to about 10 30 with panel discussions and presentations about healthy churches and ecclesiology that was a very positive sign that there are good healthy churches that are concerned about healthy membership healthy church leadership and structure a healthy approach to worship and church life and mission so that was all very very encouraging too so there are some positive signs that we want to seize upon those as we move forward yeah so once again thanks for joining us and uh, we will uh, we're, we're here for questions if you have any for us send them to podcast at calvarydothan.com and hopefully we will see you here on Sunday to worship with us if you're in Dothan. Uh, come join us, um, and uh, we'll see you next time. Remember, we're for God, for Dothan, and for the world.